I'm Tim McCarthy. I'm on the faculty here at the Kennedy School. Uh, and some of you know that. Some of you are students here at the Kennedy School. Others are uh, uh, from other parts of the community. And I just wanted to welcome everyone and thank you for coming to uh, one of our 2013-14 Audrey Lord Human Rights Lectures. Uh, this is a lecture series that you uh, probably know is named for Audre Lorde, who uh, was the legendary and iconic poet, writer, activist, essayist, and academic, uh, one of the great theorists of what we now refer to often as intersectionality. Uh, or, well, I say we at the Kennedy School. I wish we talked more about intersectionality <laughs> at the Kennedy School, which is why we have an Audre Lorde Human Rights Lecture Series here that the Carr Center uh, and the program that I run, the Sexuality, Gender, and Human Rights Program, is very proud to launch and sponsor. And I'm very, very proud today uh, to introduce to you uh, someone who I believe is one of the great uh, voices for social justice in, uh, in our generation. One of uh, the emerging kind of academics and activists who I think is really poised to change the way that we talk about a whole range of things when we talk about social justice, racial justice, gender justice, sexual justice, and so forth. Uh, Dr. Monique W. Morris um, has a, an, a doctorate in education. She's the author and social justice scholar of more than two, tw uh, with more than 20 years of professional and volunteer experience in the area of areas of education, civil rights, juvenile, and social justice. Dr. Morris is the author just this month of a book, this book called Black Stats, African Americans by the Numbers for the 21st Century. Um, though we are prohibited from selling books and signing books here at the Kennedy School, I do have a whole bunch of flyers with information about the book and how you can order it. I also just came from the Harvard Bookstore where they have multiple copies on display in the recommended section at the Harvard Bookstore. And I took a picture on my iPhone that I'm going to post on Monique's wall later on <laughs> because that's how we roll in Generation X. Uh, in addition to Black Stats, which is uh, her newest book, she's also uh, a prolific author of many, many articles and essays and reports. Uh, she has published a novel, Too Beautiful for Words, and also was the co-writer of a book called Poster Child, the Kemba Smith story with uh, Kemba Smith. Dr. Morris is a 2012 Soros Justice Fellow, the co-founder of the National Black Women's Justice Initiative Institute, and a faculty member at St. Mary's College of California and at California State University at Sacramento. She is the former Vice President for Economic Programs, Advocacy, and Research at the National Advancement for a National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, and the former Director of Research for the Thelton E. Henderson Center for Social Justice at UC Berkeley Law School. I won't go into all of the reports and writings and activism and work that Monique has done in politics and social movements and in everywhere in between, uh, but I just wanted to uh, end before passing this off to you with a more personal uh, note, two personal uh, anecdotes about Dr. Morris. Uh, who has been a friend of mine since the fall of 1993, I believe, when uh, she was still an undergraduate at Columbia College and I was just beginning graduate work there. And this was a time at Columbia where there was a lot going on. Uh, take uh, a protest at the Audubon Ballroom, which was uh, set to be demolished, a uh, place where Malcolm X was uh, assassinated. There were lots of street protests and protests in, in Harlem and in the surrounding communities of Columbia. There was a lot going on. Uh, and we also were part of the founding cohort of students that worked as research assistants for the late, great Dr. Manning Marable, who was our mentor at Columbia. And the first day I walked in, my nickname at Columbia when I was there was Manning's White Hand Man. <laughs> because I was the only white person uh, on the staff of the institute. It was an all black workplace. It's the best workplace I've ever worked in, actually. Uh, which says something. We should uh, re replicate it and model it. But I got hired and folks were like, who's this guy? And uh, Manning Marable hired me to do some research for him. And I walked into the office the first day and got to meet Monique, who is still then an undergraduate graduate, though a very fierce and brilliant undergraduate, and she said to me, she shook my hand and said to me, what do you think you know about our people? <laughs> and from there we, we had a, uh, we, we, we became uh, dearest of friends, but the kind of, <laughs> uh, I had to win her over, but the best love in the world is the kind of love that requires you to win folks over, to prove yourself over and over again, to be challenged by 
each other. And that's exactly the kind of love and the kind of friendship that, and the kind of intellectual work that Monique and I have had uh, together for many, many years now. And really now uh, 25 years, which seems almost, almost 20 years, it seems incredible. And that was a, a friendship that was born of a kind of criticality of challenges, of interrelationships, of work that we did together over and over and over again in the academy and way outside of it. And we continue to do that. And I love every minute of those uh, 20 some odd years. When our man, mentor Manning died, uh, I was on my way to give a, a lecture at Yale uh, at a human rights conference a couple of years ago when he passed away. And I got a call from one of our other colleagues and friends from Colombia, Johanna Fernandez, who was uh, on a Fulbright in Egypt at the time. And she told me, and I collapsed on my couch because Manning was just 60 and had just finished his magnum opus, the now Pulitzer Prize winning biography of Malcolm X, his, uh, his, the work that he had started when we had met him at that time. And I immediately thought, the first person that came into my mind and my heart my soul when that news came to me from halfway across the world was Monique. And so I called her and we cried and phoned together and you pulled over. You were on the, you were on the, on the highway at the time and we, she pulled over and we had a moment and we both cried and had to tried to figure out what can we do because this man, Manny Marable, was not just a scholar and a, a mentor and a towering figure in our lives. He was also in some ways, very important ways, a, a father figure, the best kind of mentor in graduate school. And, and, and though I, I, I fail at a lot in my life, one of the things that I've tried to do in my own career is to model that kind of uh, mentorship with my own graduate students that Manning was so brilliant at modeling for us. So we wouldn't be here without him. And we both um, dedicated our last two books. Monique dedicated Black Stats to Manning. I dedicated my last book on Howard Zinn to Manning. Uh, and one thing that we have decided in the wake of his untimely and premature death is that we would do everything that we could to help each other advance the work that we're doing in the world. And so it is with that spirit in the legacy of Manny Marable that I am so honored to introduce my sister, my co-conspirator, collaborator, comrade, love, uh, love of my life, Dr. Monique Morris. Thank you. I was not expecting uh, for you to tell that story. <laughs> um, one, because I don't believe in silence. <clears throat> I do believe in challenging. I do believe in asking questions. I think it's critically important for us as we uh, explore who we are and what our calling is, I can't move that, to uh, interrogate issues and to engage in a way that we may, that we may not necessarily be used to engaging. So, when I met Tim and asked him that question, it was really just out of curiosity, one, and two, as a way to, you know, this is sort of my embrace to everyone who walked in the door. This was the Institute for Research in African American Studies. You know, what are we going to do? How are we going to engage? What, what questions are we going to ask? What, you know, what is going to be our next way of engaging? Um, the work uh, that I've started to do now um, he, Tim already told you about you know, my work at the NAACP and some of the other things that I'd started to do. Um, this work around girls and women and exploring questions of justice was really born out of uh, necessity. Not to say that I'm the first person to engage in these questions or to engage in this work. This is something that's been happening long before I was even really aware of it. But in 1996, I was asked at the Institute for Research in African American Studies to help Manning put on a conference, and it was called The Crisis of Black Youth. And at that time, uh, it was maybe 95, um, but at that time, um, there was a lot of discussion about, uh, discussion about the emerging uh, prison industrial complex. And people were using f uh, sort of frameworks and discussions about um, sort of the school to prison pipeline framework had yet to be established. But there was an understanding that young people were being uh, sort of captured into this space around the criminal justice system and that there were some particular things and pathways that were leading them there. And people were ready to interrogate the question of race. People were ready to say, okay, how are we going to talk about what's happening, you know, with particularly disproportionate rates of black youth and Latino youth who are in contact with the justice system. But the framework was largely male. 
and all of us participated in it. <laughs> and all of us were engaged because the numbers were so severe and so shocking um, and happening so quickly that many of us were trying to figure out what was happening. You know, people were seeing their sons, people were seeing their nephews, their brothers, my own brother. You know, there were some things that were very deeply personal about this engagement around this question. And then, uh, you know, sort of fast forward several years and I went to work for an organization called the National Council on Crime and Delinquency. And at that time, at NCCD, I was able to go in and out of juvenile uh, detention facilities and talk to young people about what their paths had been. And in doing that, uh, I started to hear, you know, much of the same story over and over again. You know, some uh, discussions about, you know, what life had handed to them, questions about how they were going to negotiate all of this, uh, you know, sort of just complete confusion about what was happening. Um, and um, it was at that time that I decided to have a conversation with young people through a street novel called Too Beautiful for Words. And when I started to uh, engage in, you know, so, to, so uh, the book, the novel is, um, like I said, a street novel, and it's told in the first person perspective um, a discussion about prostitution. So I'm writing from the voice of a pimp, the voice of a woman who is a prostitute, um, their son and a female Black Panther in this discussion about what's happening in Oakland, sort of spanning about 20 years. And um, when, after that, I went in to have different conversations with young people. So I continued to do my research and work um, within the criminal justice and juvenile justice lens. And it brought me in wearing a different hat. So I wasn't only now, you know, Monique the researcher coming in to talk to young people. I was Monique the author of the street novel coming in to talk to young people, which allowed me to engage with them much, much differently. I'll never forget, I stepped into a circle with young women. We were processing the novel, talking about, you know, what it is that I was trying to share. I'm reading excerpts. It's all lovely. And a girl, about 11 years old, stood up and she said, Thank you for writing this novel, because I'm a prostitute. No, I'm a hoe. That's what I do. And for me to watch an 11-year-old refer to herself as a hoe and to say that that's what she does was heartbreaking. And no one was listening or seeing her. No one was really responding to her. Her story was not a part of our, our national discourses about justice or about risk. Her discussion, you know, her, her whole life story was sort of buried under this, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of, uh, well, male-dominated way that we talked about engaging in this sort of crisis of criminal justice and juvenile justice. And so from there, you know, I started to think about, you know, how are we going to start to build and, and grow these voices so that people understand what's happening, started engaging in different kinds of work, and then at, uh, maybe in 2008, I went to another meeting at this point wearing a different hat, and, uh, you know, it was a, a, com a convening of people who were working on issues uh, tied to black male achievement, and uh, everyone was sitting around the room, and one of the members of the group said, we have to do something about all these boys raised in hyper-feminine environments because it's producing gossipy boys and we have to do something about this. And the fire that I felt in my toes <laughs> that sort of ran through every bit of my body um, told me I can no longer be quiet about this. That we are operating in a space that is dominated by this, you know, we talk about intersectionality, this intersection between sexism, racism, classism, but you know, this dominant patriarchal frame that was really informing not just how we talk about what's happening in our communities, but obviously our responses or lack thereof were of great concern to me. So with that, I said, okay, I'm leaving and I'm gonna devote a good chunk of time to try to figure out how we can begin to explore these issues and start to challenge some of the frameworks that exist. So that's what I kind of want to talk to you about today, is the work that sort of emerged from that um, and why that lit a fire that has yet uh, to be put out. So the title of this discussion is Expanding Our Framework to Include Black uh, women and girls when we talk about our justice reform work. And again, do I, can I point this here or behind me? It doesn't matter it doesn't where? Matter. Okay. <laughs> um, and again, a lot of this was born of a sentiment that Audre Lorde 
said here about silence and about how we engage, right? What are the words you do not yet have? What do you need to say? What are the tyrannies you swallow day by day and attempt to make your own until you will sicken and die of them still in silence? And for me, I'm not willing to sacrifice you know, both my own health <laughs> from being angry at these comments nor the lives of girls who were, are, are absolutely being affected by our inability to bring them into these discourses about justice. Um, so when we talk about girls, I kind of want to start there and then work into you know, women and just share with you some of the things that have been shared with me in the course of doing this research and why I think it's imperative that we begin to broaden our scope and then a little bit about how we do that. So black girls um, are overrepresented in detention facilities, they're overrepresented among school suspensions, they're overrepresented among dropouts, and you know, these are conditions that are largely obscured by our conversations. And when we look at data, people will tend to say, well, Monique, you know, the numbers of males just so eclipse the numbers of females that you know it's really our real focus really needs to be on the males their population is so small what we're talking about is a marginal issue or you know a niche issue <laughs> you know those kinds of sentiments are applied to this discourse um, but the problem here of course is that that's because we're making a comparison, even with our data, but certainly in our discussions, between males and females, which is not the appropriate comparison to make. When we start to pull the data and we start to look at what's happening with girls, we see that black girls are well above other girls in their rates of, of suspension, detention, residential placement, <laughs> referrals, et cetera. And their numbers are so high that we tend to want to masculinize those experiences by comparing them to the males. Males will always have higher rates than females, unless there's really something anomalous about you know, a, a particular condition. But boys tend to be engaged in justice, uh, in the justice system, or you know, in trouble in school, or exhibit certain types of behaviors at different rates than girls do. But the rates for black girls have been so high that we tend to equate them again with the males, instead of doing a more appropriate comparison between other girls. And when we look at black girls in relation to other girls, that's when we start to really see where there's the disparity and where the disparity is even greater than the disparity among boys. And so the inability of us, or for us to even you know, construct a data narrative, a statistical narrative, that allows us to have the kinds of conversations that are needed for us to at least start uh, at a place where we you know, can really critically engage around what's happening and how we begin to construct and understand the different pathways um, to delinquency and confinement, uh, you know, it's really starts, it starts there. So this is what I say has basically led to the under-theorization of what's happening with black girls. Black girls aged 12 to 17 are among the least researched group of people black girls in the US. <laughs> so we tend to have conversations about gender justice that will talk about either girls of color in general or talk about black girls outside of the US. And we don't then center the experiences that might be uniquely constructed by some of the stereotypes and memes and ideas about black femininity that were born of you know, this deeply seated uh, inequality that came out of this construct of slavery. And we don't talk about those things. We don't talk about the ways in which you know, some of these ideas that we hold about what it is to be a black female then begins to construct how we want to engage with these young girls. You know, instead, we kind of dismiss them. We don't see them. You know, or we're just like, oh, it's too much energy, or too loud, or you know, she's a fighter, can't deal with that, or she's angry, or you know, all the other sort of pieces that roll out from some of these discussions. Um, but what it's done, I think, is present an opportunity for us to talk about you know, the, some of the multiple pathways uh, to delinquency. So I want to start with this concept of the school to prison pipeline, um, because I spent some time working on this um, as a Soros Justice Fellow and really starting to think about it, because we talk about it a lot. It's really now become a catchphrase for how we understand what happens with our young people and how we present their particular risk uh, in association with you know, sort of being in school and being at increased risk of confinement. But we talk about it as a linear pipeline, right, which really captures you know, sort of a relationship between school, 
and the justice system. And the way that I have defined it is uh, as such, the collection of policies, practices, conditions, and prevailing consciousness that facilitate criminalization within educational environments and the processes by which this criminalization results in the incarceration of youth and young adults. So it's not just, you know, sort of someone picked up on campus and sort of taken directly to a condition of confinement, right? But it's almost how we talk about it. We'll, we'll say, okay, so this is the pipeline, somebody got arrested on campus, they got hauled off to court, or somebody's arrested on campus, they got taken to the juvenile hall, and that's our only way of really understanding it. And my argument has been that we largely understand it in these terms because we have constructed it based upon the narrative of males who tend to disproportionately have that particular experience. Girls don't necessarily have that experience. And when I've engaged with you know, direct service providers or talked to the girls themselves about what their pathways actually look like, you start to see some you know, crooked roads. You start to see a couple of detours this way and that way before they actually end up in a condition of confinement. But it still has a relationship to what has happened in school. And you know, that's you know, primarily where, or what hasn't happened in school, I should say. Can you talk about the age group a bit? Because yeah, I'm going to get to some of that, yeah. So I want to start with, um, actually, I want to start with this. So just to sort of ground us, nationwide, you know, black girls are about 16% of the female population under the age of 18, um, but they account for 42% of the total number, number of girls in secure de uh, juvenile detention facilities and 37% of the girls in detention in other secure correctional facilities. Um, and so you start already to see the disproportionate nature at which they are confined. Um, but when you start there, you start to ask the questions, you know, sort of how are they getting there? Like what are some of the things that are, you know, leading them at different age groups? So to your question, um, and, and you start to see some of these kinds of examples around the country. So you start to see a case of teenage girls, he, either who, um, are seen as defiant, <laughs> right? Because they don't adhere or, you know, sort of quickly respond favorably to something that they've been told to do. Um, you get girls like Marche who decided to wear that outfit to the prom, and when she was told that it was too revealing, she, you know, responded unfavorably. She was like, "What do you mean? I'm not going anywhere." And it ended up with her being arrested, um, and and kicked off this the school prom grounds and taken into custody. Um, you've got Ashley, who uh, has a, a, a developmental disorder and was in a detention study hall. And uh, allegedly, the proctor for the uh, study hall threw a book at her. Um, and when she responded unfavorably and was escorted out of the, the room, um, law enforcement slammed her into uh, you know, the lockers and some other uh, behaviors followed that. Uh, which you know ultimately resulted in her being taken into custody as well and harmed. Um, most people know about Kiara Wilmot, who had the science experiment gone wrong, um, and who you know had faced a suspension. All of that's been reversed, but she still suffers un, you know from the stigma of potentially being labeled as a terrorist, and so you know she's nervous about that. And then you've got cases like this one, Pelagia in L.A., where something was taking place in the cafeteria. Someone dropped a piece of cake. She didn't pick it up, and the officer didn't like her response, and this is what she got. And then you've got little girls. So when they're really young, you know, some of, some of the most egregious cases of how we apply zero tolerance policies in this country actually happen with little girls. But we don't really talk about that, right? So you've got cases, you know, like these two who were six and seven years old having a tantrum in class, and the tantrums were probably really bad tantrums. They're throwing stuff. They're, you know, yelling and kicking and screaming. So it was a wild tantrum. I've seen worse tantrums, of course. Um, but they called the police in. They called the police in. And what's interesting about all of this is when you start to have conversations about you know, sort of this cycle of young girls having tantrums and the police are called, or older girls saying that they're not engaged and the police is called, or having some of these, you know, sort of opportunities, you know, to construct our narrative for these particular cases. These are the ones that made the, the news media. I've got pictures because we talked about these. Somehow we picked up on these because it happened in a way that we're familiar you know, in, in, in a familiar way that we understand this process. It happened on a school grounds, law enforcement was involved, they were taken to, uh, into custody. 
But even though we saw these, not everybody was familiar with these cases. You know, not everybody is aware that you know girls might have been picked up for violating a dress code, or that there might have been something you know happening with a girl who has uh, a particular developmental disorder or disability and is falling asleep in class, and that's seen as an affront to the teacher. And their response was to engage in some of these other kinds of you know behaviors that are highly, highly questionable. We don't really engage in these kinds of ways. So you know, I asked the question, what do we see? Because we don't even really see them. <laughs> we don't really ask. But when we do see them, it's because they tell us something that's either so egregious that it catches our attention, like how could this be? Or it's consistent with a dominant narrative around what the pipeline looks like, school directly to confinement. So I wrote this paper um, in 2012 called um, Race, Gender, and the School to Prison Pipeline, Expanding Our Discussion to Include Black Girls. And in that, I took a look at the literature, and I wanted to sort of explore what was happening and how girls were showing up in some of the academic and, and, uh, liter literature and scholarship on this issue, and also just to try to see you know, how much of it was out there. You know, what, where, where were we in this conversation about justice in girls? And you know, one of the things, one of the conclusions that I had uh, was that the school to prison pipeline was just too narrow a framework for us to really capture and see black girls. So I don't use that term anymore. I call this you know, school to confinement pathways because I felt that it was a much better way for me to better uh, understand the multiple ways in which girls are rendered uh, you know, both invisible in the pipeline, but also how we can engage in conversations about interrupting multiple pathways to delinquency and confinement. So what I say here, you know, is that the primary shortcoming of, you know, this pipeline analogy, although catchy and I get the urgency of it, um, assumes that males and females have the same sort of trajectory and experience with the law. There's an assumption that when we say the school to prison pipeline that we're talking about both boys and girls and we're not necessarily seeing all the girls. Uh, the other thing is that by assuming you know, that we're capturing both you know, males and females in this narrative, it, it doesn't allow us to really engage in how we're not capturing them. So it, we haven't seen a reduction in the rates of confinement among girls. When programs are established and interventions are set up, you might have some participation of girls, but it's not intentional. Programs aren't necessarily gender responsive or culturally competent in the lens, you know, with its intersections with cultural competency. Um, and the frame also is not holistic, right? So what you get is, um, with the pathways analogy, is an opportunity for us to explore all of these different issues, not just the schools piece, but, and I'm going to describe what I mean by some of the school issues next, um, but not just the school piece, but all the other things that might be tied to what happens if they're not in school. So there are several educational pathways to delinquency for black girls, and that the literature talks about. Academic marginalization, um, abuse history, Victimization in schools and out of school, um, and I mean specifically sexual victimization. Um, disparate use of exclusionary discipline in response to black female gender nonconformity, and that's an issue that has come up um, in different ways, and I think, again, is under-theorized and under-explored. So what I mean by that is the way that we talk about black femininity often in schools and the way that schools respond to it is if a, if a girl is loud, or seemed to be aggressive, she is perceived as a problem. They don't really know how to address that. You know, get her out of here, or oh, what are you doing? Largely because what we see when we, when we see her is that she's not being a good girl. She's not quiet. She doesn't adhere to what has come to be known as you know, sort of white middle class norms of femininity. Her laugh might be loud. Her her engagement with material might seem like she's challenging authority, but really she's just asking questions about what it is that you're t asking her to learn. And because there is an absence you know, of really understanding some of these things, those are seen and used in real life <laughs> as reasons to exclude her from the classroom. Uh, and even 
it, it gets even worse in many ways. And those are the cases where the girl is actually presenting as female, right? So in the cases where the girl is not presenting as female or where there is an explicit rejection of, of sort of normative gender expression, uh, you know, then the issue is even worse <laughs> where schools don't necessarily know how to engage. Her behavior is seen as masculine. Uh, she's, you know, disruptive because she hangs with the boys and they don't know how to respond to that in good time. And what's happened is a lot of girls are sent to the office, a lot of girls are sent home from school, which renders them vulnerable to participation in underground economies, which then can lead them into contact with the justice system. Um, there's also the issue of moral panic. So. <laughs> When the zero tolerance policies were put in place, there was a lot of discussion about, you know, sort of we need these metal detectors and we need these sort of what I call instruments of surveillance, law enforcement in schools, probation officers in schools, all of these sort of things that, and, and people and ideas to control a particular population of kids who were deemed to be more prone to violence. And in that narrative was, you know, sort of this underlying space around, you know, how are we going to develop uh, you know, sort of punitive responses to kids who get in trouble and who are not, um, you know, necessarily keeping in line with the other kids, right? And in this work, there's been, um, you know, there, some of the research talks about how people assumed that certain kids were going to be more likely to violence. And because of that, really started to hamp down and, 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 and you know, really pull in some of probably the most punitive responses to, to normal adolescent or pre-adolescent behavior that we have ever seen in our culture. And it doesn't happen everywhere, but in schools that are predominated by kids of color, we see that there is a propensity to use more punishment in response to normal adolescent behavior. So instead of saying, you know, take a minute out, go take a breather, you know, things that were even said to me in my private school, right? calm down, let's deal with this issue, they don't get that opportunity. In these schools, they get, you know, that's it, you're out. If you raise a question, I mean, I've, I've witnessed it. People wanting to raise a question or girls not sure about something, and because they don't want to put their hand down because they really don't get it, the teacher says, I told you to put your hand down, that's it, you're out. And the girls, then, then, then you have a problem, <laughs> right? As one might suspect, to feel like you can't have a voice, you can't ask a question, uh, is then grounds for the girls, to, or they see it as grounds for them to engage differently uh, to, to get their questions answered. So these are all parts of what at least the data are capturing. Um, and then there are other trends too that impact how we begin to see girls in this sort of trajectory between uh, schools and confinement. And one of the sort of biggest indicators of risk is this question of suspension. Um, exclusionary discipline, so out of school suspensions, expulsion. Um, I spent some time with um, some young women who were in a juvenile court school and uh, the overwhelming majority of them had had a history of suspensions and expulsion. Um, largely for them that was partly what gave them you know, sort of license to be on the street, uh, was that they had been out, kicked out of school, they were not engaged, and they were like, great, it's my time, and they would go do something they shouldn't have been doing. But the rates of suspension among black girls is absolutely alarming. And yet, even in our State of the Union address when we were talking about achievement and, and young people, our president only mentioned boys of color. And so here you have, in Oakland, the suspension rate for black girls is three times the rate for Latinas and more than seven times the rate for white and API girls. In Chicago, the suspension rate for black girls in secondary schools is nearly 42%, which is four times the rate for white girls and approximately two and a half times the rate for Latinas. The same with Detroit, where you see you know, the suspension rate for black girls in secondary schools at 19% higher than the rate for white girls and three times the rate for Latinas. Atlanta, New Orleans, we see it in city after city after city where black girls are in, at increased risk of suspension uh, and expulsion. These are just suspension rates, but at suspension and expulsion in a way that should construct our narrative to be about healthy youth development, but instead we still have only talked about this in terms of how it's affecting uh, boys of color. So then I started to explore qualitatively 
what's happening, <laughs> right? What is, what is leading to all of this? Why, why aren't we able to see what's happening with these girls? And led some focus groups um, with the African American Policy Forum to look at these issues. And so I want to start by reading this story from a young woman who was talking about why she got suspended. I was in the fifth grade, and this boy, he kept spitting them spitballs through a straw at me while we was taking a test. I told the teacher, and he told him to stop, but of course he didn't. He kept doing it, so I got up and I yelled at him, and he punched me in my face, like in my eye. My eye was swollen and everything. I don't even remember if I fought him, because that's just how it ended, I think. But I remember that we both got suspended, and I was like, why did I get suspended? I was like a victim. All the girls rushed to my side, they took me down to the nurse, and then it was just a mess. So in this story, you know, um, I'm drawn to this story because it tells me something about how she then interpreted um, whether the school was there to protect her. And this, in this particular case, the uh, young girl who this happened to, this was the first of many suspensions, many subsequent suspensions. And so what she learned from this was, the school is not here to protect me, so if someone fights me or steps to me for a fight, I have to fight back. Which meant that she was vulnerable to increased suspension because now she's a fighter. Because the school didn't respond. The school suspended her. She didn't understand what was happening. She was like, I'm the one who got hit, and yet under the zero tolerance policies, because she was involved in a fight, both of them were suspended, no matter what. So we begin to see you know, some of these issues and narratives take shape there. Another example is this one. A 13-year-old girl, um, in Cal the last case was from New York. This one is from California, where uh, a 13-year-old girl said this to me. When you're a prostitute, because I have been one for a couple months now, like when you're a prostitute, you've got to stop going to school because prostituting is something that you have to do all day. But you could still go to school for like a couple of months. You could still get your education. That's if he lets you. And in this case, she was very young. And the ways in which uh, some of the uh, sort of dynamics around prostitution take place, particularly in this community, is a lot of the guys will be much older. So in her case, her boyfriend was 26 years old. And so there was a, obviously a certain power dynamic between a 26-year-old and a 13-year-old. Um, and the ways in which she sort of interpreted her ability to go to school were largely contingent upon what he would allow her to do. Or really, her, her place in life was largely constructed by what he would allow her to do. And so for girls who had participated in you know, prostitution or who are commercially sexually exploited the way that she is or was, um, you know, there's a particular additional vulnerability around whether or not she's going to go to school and what happened. In her case, she was, this is a girl who was um, bullied in school. And girls would tease her. She would go to school each day, but some girls would tease her. Other girls, you know, sort of got wind of what she was doing, so they would kind of talk about that in the school. And then finally, they would sort of pick fights with her every day. She didn't really want to fight, so her reaction to it was to write on the walls of the school. Um, I know this is recorded. Sorry. Okay. She wrote, I hate the bitches in this school. <laughs> and it was so sad on so many levels. One, because that is what got her kicked out of the school. Vandalism is what got her kicked out of the school, which gave her a license to be on the street. And the school's inability to recognize that she was being bullied and to respond appropriately, either because she wasn't telling, which has its own culture, of course, in the school, and because you know the girls, at least in this school, were very adept at keeping it from those in positions of authority, right? Um, but this type of aggression between and among the girls was leading her to feel that school was not the place for her. And so she opted out. And this is what we got, was her saying, I know education is important, but I'm going to go do my thing at this point. Other issues that we find um, are girls who may have other ideas about what it means to be a good girl. 
This quote comes from a young uh, woman who identifies as female, LGBT, and yet she's sort of in a, a space where she doesn't adhere strictly to uh, gender expression norms. So she said, I don't ever have mom figures. It's always either a male teacher or something. I don't know what it is. Like ever since I was little, I always wanted to play with the boys, always, you know, stuff like that. But it's not just like being attracted to male teachers and stuff like that, but it's always male, never a female. And for her, she was in school trying to connect. People kept trying to put her in girls groups and she didn't want it. <laughs> she was saying she wanted to hang out with the guy. She wanted to find something that kept her in school, but everyone's sort of forced identity uh, onto her. Everyone was trying to sort of force, I guess, their expectations of what she should be and how she should behave onto her till finally she checked out uh, as well. And so the point here that I'm making um, through some of these stories is that, you know, there are all of these voices that are tied to, you know, sort of stories of how they opted out. And almost none of them have to do with two women and girls and engage in a process of repairing that relationship. So, for example, some of my writings on the role of the juvenile court school will talk about how a juvenile court school, which is the school that's offered to young people um, when they're in confinement, um, has a unique opportunity to repair that girl's relationship with school. So not just about you know, whether she can stop fighting for the time being or whether she's confined or engaged in the space, but what can you do in those four hours that you're required to go to school or you know, that you're um, held in this space to repair a severed relationship with an institution? Um, and then to be gender responsive, it must also deal with the racial biases, stereotypes, and memes associated with femininity with black femininity. There's a sort of dominant masculinity frame that we say, you know, we kind of understand, we kind of see how some people are perceived as threats, but we don't, still don't really understand how the women and girls are seen as threats, right? And what, how we're responding to them in ways that might necessarily be inconsistent with what their real needs are because we're still approaching them as if they are, are, are males. You know, one of the dominant things we used to say is, or what, one of the things we used to say is, don't take a program painted pink and think that you are now gender responsive. That there are some unique needs around them being mothers, unique needs around safety, unique needs around victimization histories, unique needs around trauma, unique needs around their identity and assumption of even some of the historical norms that have shaped how people receive and perceive black women that will impact how effective a strategy is for reducing risk and also reducing um, confinement if we're going to use that as you know, some of our, our basic measures of, of how well we're doing with our justice system. Um, and then you know, understand that, uh, that, again, there are multiple ways in which women and girls are engaged in the justice system, that it just doesn't, it just doesn't emerge from being picked up on the street and then ending up in, or picked up at school and then ending up in uh, a condition of confinement or uh, you know, sort of being the victim of um, uh, surveillance or any of these other things that sometimes their victimization then leads to their increased risk and vulnerability in participating in underground economies that render them uh, at increased risk of being um, later confined or even if it doesn't result in confinement being under the jurisdiction of a criminal justice agency so on probation uh, pro, you know, parole or one house arrest, any of those other ways in which you may not be in a, in, in a facility, but you're still under the jurisdiction of the justice system. And then I think it's important to uh, expand our criminalize, uh, expand our framework. So right now, you know, when we engage in conversations about justice reform, again, we overwhelmingly talk about it in terms of incarceration. And if we do that, we're always going to be in a conversation that compares males to females. And that is not a productive conversation. <laughs> that if we begin to explore the ways in which we're all vulnerable to, or both males and females are vulnerable to criminalization, we can take a step back and start to see all these multiple pathways to delinquency, to uh, you know, crimin criminality, 
et cetera. And in doing that, in, in framing it, you know, some people will say, that's just so big, you know, I can't wrap my brain around criminalization, and it's just so subjective, and I can't engage with, you know, incarceration is tangible, we see the numbers, we see the, the figures, and, you know, my argument is that incarceration is absolutely tangible, so too are all the things that I was just pointing out. So too are victimization rates, so too are arrest rates, so too are, you know, probation and parole rates. Like, we can engage in this a different, in a different way such that we really do begin to talk about policies that criminalize versus, you know, policies that necessarily only talk about incarceration. And it's a very simple request, and it's a very simple uh, tweak that could, I think, have a very big impact on being far more inclusive of women than our current construct is. Um, also, uh, you know, one, one of the things that, that I have here is that our inclusive justice reform agenda must respond to the unique ways in which race and gender intersect and inform uh, experiences with various structures of dominance. And so, you know, in these structures of dominance, in these spaces where institutions reinforce social ideas, in these places where we're reproducing ideas that then lead to practice and policy to uh, engage with these populations, we've got to think critically about how we're framing this work. And we're comfortable using language, we're comfortable using paradigms that are narrow in scope because it's perceived as be, having the biggest bang for its buck. I mean, it's really, you know, and this is a policy school, so when people talk about policy, they're talking about, you know, how far is our money going to go? What does it mean in real time? And having been in positions where I'm preparing memos, you know, that will ultimately reach the president, I'm very familiar with those spaces. However, I think it's also important for us to maintain an authenticity around this conversation, such that we're not always looking at this through a sort of DC beltway politics lens. I think it's important to engage in, you know, and maintain our own integrity with respect to these issues such that we're not only seeing this as a let's get a quick win, but let's try to figure out a way to construct a narrative that affects the largest body of people. And when we do that, we'll, I think, begin to see some real uh, changes. Um, the last thing I'll say before I open it up, because I would like to have some discussion, is that um, you know, oftentimes when I'm talking about these issues and, you know, people will say, you're always so critical of black men, boys, you know. <laughs> and, and for me, it's absolutely not about that. So I, I just have to say that. It is not about that. I love that black men and boys have been engaged in this conversation because there is a need to engage in this conversation. I have a problem <laughs> with the exclusion of women and girls because we're sharing homes, we share communities, we share schools, we share conditions. And then, and you know, I've, I've been known to say to only address males simply means that you are never going to have the result you're looking for because you've left out a very significant part of this population. And women and girls are worthy of our investment regardless of whether they've partnered with a male, given birth to a male, or somehow are you know, willing to stand next to a male. Because it doesn't always work for girls. It doesn't always work for women to do that. And in fact, that's partly <laughs> leading to some of the conditions that we see that are obscured in that conversation. So I'll pause and let's talk. Yeah. I have lots of questions, but I wanted to thank you so very much because I've been on, involved in a couple of boards that have focused on the school to prison pipeline and I'm embarrassed to say that I haven't noticed before that really they do speak about it in terms of young men and this is a real illuminating talk for me. But so I mean this is an easy question and I say that facetiously. So what do we do about it? I mean first of all I'd be interested to know if the alternative disciplinary programs are applied more discriminatorily by white teachers and administrators against African American girls, or if it's if there isn't a racial issue there. Because you talk about black girls say, you know, being loud or this or that and not being seen to conform to a white feminine norm. Is that true? Is that a norm adopted also by African American teachers and administrators, or is, is there a racial dimension there? 
Um, and then second, just the overall question of, you know, just the, it, it, it's just so devastating to think, like, what can we do about this? It seems so endemic to the current educational system to yank these kids out and, and, and therefore determine their mm -hmm. whole future mm -hmm. adversely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I'll start with your second question okay. around the racial dimension um, and administrators. So um, there is evidence to suggest that uh, the race of an administrator is uh, not as closely tied as we might think to the use of exclusionary discipline. Um, what it's closer, it's, it's, it's really tied to the population of students. So, you know, the way that I talk about this is in terms of internalized oppression <laughs> and that there are constructs around normative behaviors that all of us sort of buy into to be, you know, sort of functional uh, in, our, in our environments. And uh, there are politics <laughs> tied to these, you know, sort of elements of respectability that are absolutely rooted and, or absolutely have, you know, sort of racial roots. Um, that said, you know, so there are cases, you know, again, some egregious ones that were orchestrated by black administrators. Um, there was a recent case where a girl had locks and she, was, she had to leave. You know, that wasn't a white administrator, wasn't a white school. <laughs> you know? um, that said, though, there are, there's also data that shows that in the, in the unique decision-making capacity as a teacher and administrator when the girl is black, um, that some of the norms around you know, being a good girl or behaving appropriately. You know, some of these terms that are used um, in schools are, are not always coming out of, or, or more than not coming out of the mouths of teachers who are not black women. Um, and uh, I've seen some, and I think there's some interesting innovative work happening uh, in, in parts of the country to begin to explore what happens when you either teach and or train teachers to recognize some of these things and um, you know to talk more about what some of the alternatives are. Um, I've been a part of discussions in the Bay Area that look at the uh, relevance and promise of restorative practice with black girls. Um, because what I'm seeing and, and what we've seen in different communities is that we'll develop, you know, we talk about alternatives largely in terms of restorative practice and positive behavioral intervention uh, systems, so the PBIS and restorative justice. And when we're talking about these two ways of engaging in trying to alter behaviors and practices in schools, um, you know, we often talk about them as if they, even though they're very promising in terms of shifting a paradigm, they still have to be delivered to a population. So because so much of our framework has been around men and boys, some of the girls aren't even sent to those programs. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, in, in some cases, I've been fortunate enough where just asking the question, well, what about the girls, will lead to there being more girls assigned to the program as an alternative. But when you don't have someone asking where are the girls, and there's been such a dominant discussion about the boys, the boys get access to the alternatives um, at a much higher rate than the girls. Um, there was a horrible story that a young woman told me uh, when I, she was sort of walking through her own story, and she was saying that her, her boyfriend uh, had dropped out of school, and she talks about how she stood there by his side, how she made sure he got to his program, how you know there were all these programs designed to meet his needs because they were the focus. And um, when I said, well, you're, you're taking him to these programs. <laughs> she was like, yeah. And I said, like, so you were there with him during the day? And she said, yeah. I said, well, did anyone at any time ask you why you were not in school? And she said, no. And it was almost like, no, no one could see that she w could have benefited from the same program. <laughs> Maybe not in the same you know, way, but it, she, knew, she was also in need, obviously, of a program to get her back in school. And people were comfortable with her being, you know, accompanying her boyfriend there. So you know, I think it's not just to put this you know, to the onus of blame on, on teachers, because I think there's a role all of us play when we see these things and when we don't respond. So on the what can we do, um, one of the things that um, that's actually central to why I started this institute <laughs> and, and why we're developing it in such a way that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's early on in its stage. It's in a very uh, embryonic stage. But 
the idea here is that there's a lot more scholarship that's needed, there's a lot more practice that's needed. The basic thing that we can begin to do is interrogate and challenge wherever there is in a male-only space to really start to think about how we might make it much more inclusive of the full population that is negatively harmed by these policies and practices that lead to criminalization. That's not to say that every response is going to be appropriate, because I think there are I believe in gender responsive programming. So I think you know, there are some things that will be more appropriate for males, some things that will be more appropriate for females, but allowing us to engage in a conversation that is not exclusively male when we're elevating risk and crisis, I think is, is very important. And that just starts with what we're willing to, the questions we're willing to ask, the ways in which we're willing to move, and you know, what we're willing to fund, what, you know, how we're willing to write up papers, how we're willing to engage and enter this conversation. So. I I think there's something that all of us can do in that regard. Oh, I think she yeah. I was wondering if you could speak, if, if at all, if your work has looked at uh, the ways in which the realignment of California's criminal justice system and recent juvenile justice reforms. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I heard a lot of, about the, the men statistics when I was there. But yep. not so I was just at a conference that looked at women <laughs> and realignment. And unfortunately, women have not been a part of the narrative around realignment, and as a result, they've been underserved. Um, there are probably a handful of programs that, so the realignment in California, for those who don't know, um, was a way to reduce the prison population and to take non-non-non, uh, so non-violent, uh, you know, non-felony, um, you know, so, so the least severe cases and uh, put them back in the community in one way, shape, or form. There's a huge problem with overcrowding in California's prisons. Um, and, you know, California is a unique space in that much of our state economy is fueled by prisons. <laughs> so, you know, we're sort of in this space where we talk about reducing prison, but really we're not because we talk about building little prisons, not big prisons. You know, just sort of reducing big prisons to make little prisons and that way everybody's happy. Um, so what we're doing, so unfortunately women have been underserved in that space, um, which is a tremendous uh, human rights issue for the state. And uh, for the conference that at least I attended, um, what was obvious in the discussion was that because no one had really paid attention to women, there really is not a lot of research on what the numbers are actually saying. And while there are some programs that are you know, sort of generally designed to receive populations and might include a few women, that there really hasn't been a concerted effort in organizing space around making sure that women are actively involved in the realignment space. Um, I remember having a conversation in the Bay Area early on to say, you know, don't forget about women and let's try to develop something now to receive them as they come back. And I was told by a key decision maker, I can't justify that with my money because I don't think there are enough women who are going to come back that we need to develop a program or specific strategy for women because they're just too small in number. So again, our inability to even anchor our discussion in, you know, sort of our analysis of data in meaningful ways impacts how we're constructing responses around something as basic as a realignment. So the good news is that um, because of this conference and because of some other agitators in our state, um, there are, you know, new conversations about ways in which we might be able to support these um, populations of women, but there are some unique needs around, you know, really making sure they're prepared to enter and re-enter in a way uh, that just doesn't lead to future incarceration in local jails as opposed to the state prison. And then at the, oh, you were just pointing me that no, way? No, no, okay. No, <laughs> okay. Um, so it seems like um, a lot of sort of the qualitative research you were showing starts with, um, I guess you described it as poor relationships with institutions and sort of the, the racialized norms within institutions as there's this inciting incident that then leads yeah. Um, to the exclusion, <clears throat> and you mentioned the possibility of programs that would rebuild that relationship. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? So, I talk about strategies to rebuild okay. um, the relationship because, I, you know, I'm from the Bay Area, and we have also the nonprofit industrial complex <laughs> that people say, um, <laughs> but there is. Um, I think unique ways that different existing organizations can work with 
uh, populations of girls and, and, and young women who are at increased risk. And a lot of it comes from you know, the same sort of particular elements that I was talking about here in, in terms of really building trust, allowing these young women and girls to take on leadership positions, helping them to deconstruct some of the ideas and their own internalization of ideas about what it means to be a you know, person, a woman, a female, a girl under these certain conditions, and to really try to build capacity there. I, off, I rarely use the word empowerment because I don't think anyone can empower someone else. I think you can build capacities in people to really begin to explore their own ways of engaging. So what I've been doing is to work with different populations to pull in formerly incarcerated people to be part of the, de the design and you know, development of of um, ways of connecting people with institutions in ways that they were not before. And I think it's, you know, it feels like a, it's a very broad way that I'm describing it because I think it needs to be tailored per institution. Each institution, each, you know, sort of community has its own culture. And being aware of that culture and being aware of some of the unique conditions that are leading, you know, particular populations into these, you know, spaces of risk is all central to this conversation and being responsive to that. So it's almost like, you know, instead of saying, here's the prescriptive, you know, way to be and do it, we need to be, we need to just make sure that we have a checklist of things we're always aware of and engage in a way that allows us to, you know, make sure that we're asking these sets of questions in order for us to develop an appropriate response. Yeah. So, do you think it's our dependence on these institutions as part of the problem? Because, for example, even if you don't, um, Yeah. So I, I personally feel that we should um, try to find more strategies where we're not waiting for some system to decide that, oh, we will actually give them a fair chance. Like, for example, <coughs> if there's so many people getting suspended on the streets and, and, and unemployment is such an issue, couldn't there be a way that we come around and, like, it build capacity to have homeschool? Like, I wouldn't want my child in an American public school, personally. So, like, why can't we build class? Like we have technology now, we have so many other resources. Maybe we should get, get a little bit more creative in finding solutions that work for us and design them ourselves. Um, there are, you know, there are folks who take that reaction and, and use those means of providing an alternative learning space. Um, but not everybody can afford to do that, right? Like some people have to just, you know, work so they can't homeschool. But I think, but I think your point about uh, reliance on systems is an important one because I think it's also tied to um, what happens, you know, in terms of how we define and engage around risk. So in many communities, you can't get services unless you are involved in the justice system. So if there are kids who, you know, are exhibiting certain behaviors and they know they need medical attention, for example, some of the recommendations that come from key decision makers will be call the police because once your kids in the system you'll have access to this that and the other so many kids get detained and that's their first that's the first time they've been screened in a long time that's deeply problematic now it's also though you know a way that people are starting to see a new role and function around schools and what this opportunity is for schools to be less you know about you know sort of you know the development of specific academic skills not less but not only about that but um, also be inclusive of wraparound services that can provide some of these uh, services and opportunities for young people before uh, they end up you know having some troubles so I mean, I think people are always creative and thinking about new schools. I mean, there, there are tons of charter schools. There are tons of other ways that people are engaging. Um, and for some, home schools. Uh, but the, the real issue here, though, is that there's, there's public education in this country <laughs> that's supposed to be public. And it's not supposed to be discriminatory. And the first time a black child gets introduced to key black literature shouldn't be when they are in the juvenile hall. And so, and for many kids, it is. And a lot of these institutions will say, look at our schools, look at our, you know, come here, Monique, let's take you on a tour. I want you to see how culturally competent we are in this space. And it's, it's upsetting because you, you're like, okay, so for the first time in this kid's life, when they see someone like them on the wall, it's here. <laughs>
And that's problematic. You're absolutely right. That is problematic. Um, and that's where advocates, families, communities come into play in the community to say, you know, let's make sure our curriculum is more inclusive. And I mean, you know, I, I went to schools where that wasn't the norm, but I created it myself because I was like, that's not what I do. I'm going to write the trustees and tell them I need a class that teaches me this and this. And that was my personal reaction to it, but not everybody's going to do that either. So there are education advocates who are looking at the qualities of education. There's tons of literature on the importance and effects of culturally competent education and pedagogy. All of that exists. It's whether or not we're going to implement it um, is a question. Is there a question over here? Yeah. Um. I found that there was kind of this missing piece. Um, so I work with foster youth. I was mm -hmm. foster youth. And um, foster youth are predominantly of color. And particularly girls of color, black girls, um, are alienated in the foster care system. Like, a lot of foster youth enter the foster care system because they are suspended constantly. They drop out of school. Yep. Um, and in the foster youth system, they if you if they find you to be not appropriate for a foster home, they put you in group homes. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. a lot of group homes are predominantly, again, of a certain race. Yeah. Um, and if you don't <coughs> behave in the group homes, then the next place is incarceration. Yeah. And so, and then there's a back and forth yeah. that happens. Yeah. Yeah. So I just wonder how that's going to happen. Thank you for raising that, because actually the quote from the girl who said, I don't have mom figures, she's a foster youth also. And I meant to mention that. Um, because that is an important element of this work. Um, you know, kids who are dual jurisdiction, who are on both the dependency and delinquency sides in the course do face an additional challenge. Um, and, you know, the, the absence of, you know, sort of real engagement around both the disproportionality issue, but also the ways in which foster youth are vulnerable to all types of uh, conditions that can exacerbate their risk and criminalization is really not a part of our narrative, and it should be. Uh, now, the kids, you know, I would say, you know, it's an important part of how we construct the narrative around risk, but it's also really tied, I would say, to how schools function and how institutions receive kids who are in these systems. So, you know, not even just that, that foster youth might bounce around from, you know, school to school um, or might have a, a period of time where they're in a facility and then back in a home or in a facility to be held before they're put in additional, in another place of uh, res uh, uh, residential placement. Um, but the, the, the grading systems <laughs> are inconsistent depending on wherever they go, which really sort of sets them up for failure. And that's something that, you know, I've been increasingly concerned about and that I hope to be um, working with some folks on in the Bay Area um, because, again, these are very local discussions. So, I mean, I, I present these like education and justice or national issues, and they are national issues, but the way that we respond to them has to be so localized because districts are all and jurisdictions are all unique in how they respond to some of these issues. But it's absolutely something to keep on the radar. I appreciate you raising it. Yeah. Can I ask a of question? Of course. <laughs> um, the, you know, your new book is Black Stats. Yeah. So many of the statistics that are in this book and also the statistics that you're using are um, really can rock you, right? You, yeah. you, you rock you into a kind of consciousness or reckoning with the problem, right? But, you know, the old saying is the statistics don't lie, people do. And yeah. so some people, right, in policy arenas, right, or even cultural institutions that shape the way that we think about policy, might look at some of those statistics and be like, see how, you know, how these people are more prone to be this way, sure. right? And there's a kind of cultural argument mm -hmm. that people who are, who are trying to use data to change structures and transform yeah. institutions yeah. are always up against, yeah. always fighting yeah, yeah. that kind of culture war, right? Yeah. And, and it seems to me that one of the things that is most profound about your research and also what you're trying to call for in a policy way is that too often when we think about policies, we're thinking about what can we do with schools to fix schools? What can we do with the criminal justice system to fix the criminal justice system? What can we do with trafficking or prostitution or sex work, whatever, to mm -hmm. deal with that. Mm -hmm. And that these are compartmentalized, that we're not actually having 
a structural policy conversation about schools to prisons through streets and all these pathways that you're talking about. And it seems to me that in the qualitative data that you're looking at, right, these interviews and conversations and focus groups and so forth that you've done so much of, right, that it actually allows us to open up a story of interconnection between these various often too compartmentalized policy realms. So how do you, but people don't want to hear stories, right? Policymakers want data, they want and foundations and funding streams want data, right? They want measurement and evaluation, right? They don't want stories. And yet the stories, in my opinion, and I'm biased mm -hmm, mm -hmm, for all the reasons you know, actually open up a way to have a much more integrated conversation about the structural injustices that produce the larger crisis. Mm -hmm. So how do you as yes, a person yes. who has mixed methods research yeah, yeah. make the case for these stories? Yeah. So, you know, when I wrote Black Stats, mm -hmm. um, it was really to compile information that can launch discussion. And I say that in the book, that no experience can be fully captured in numbers. <laughs> and that, you know, in the introduction, you know, Khalil Gibran Muhammad, who directs the Schomburg uh, Center for Research in Black Culture in New York, um, has a pretty strong critique of statistics, given the, how they've been used against the black community and to shape a particular narrative around criminality and um, other, you know, sort of stereotypes that have, yeah, followed, you know, certain interpretations of behavior and conditions. And, uh, you know, so, you know, the point of the stats is that they do help to anchor our discussions mm -hmm. and that they present for us uh, you know, sort of a place to begin. But I also say that these statistics and others um, are really only reflective of the questions that have already been asked. <laughs> and that there's so much more for us to know about some of these conditions that you're not going to get from a number. That there is, you know, but with each of these stories, I could illustrate certain things with numbers to give you a sense of the magnitude or, you know, severity of a condition. You know, disparities data um, where I spend a lot of time is a very powerful tool to begin to discuss equity. Um, that said, it doesn't shape, it, it can't explain how this is coming to be, <laughs> right? And alone, it doesn't help us understand what we need to do, right? So I think, you know, the point around black stats and the way, you know, the reason I include so many statistics, even in this presentation and mixed with the um, narratives, is that, you know, there are multiple ways to tell a story. And you can tell a story using, you know, different tools that are available to us, and this is one way. You know, if we wanted to even broaden the scope, we could use, you know, we could bring in some of our presentational knowing, and I could tell a story through photos. And we would know something a little differently if we were to look at a series of pictures that might, you know, tell us something else about, you know, what this looks like for women and girls. Um, and I, I did some of that, even when you're seeing this girl's face on, you know, the table, or you're seeing a little girl girl with her hands in handcuffs. How we interpret all of these things is based upon our, our discussions and, you know, sort of our, our resonating consciousness around these issues. So th that's why, you know, I say we talk about the school to prison pipeline, we talk about incarceration as a, as a consciousness um, that can shift. And, and that's the important thing for me to just communicate here is that I really believe that our consciousness can shift and when we start to have a more expansive engagement around these issues, that's when I think we'll start to see some outcomes shift as well. Maybe time for one more question, honey. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hearing you speak a little bit more about the teacher versus school level versus like family leaders. I'm mean, like, where is coming from this? I don't know that much about this, but uh, just from anecdotally from friends who are teachers, where there's like a very strict school level or even school regional level, network level set of disciplinary principles that they feel kind of compelled to implement. And then there's consequences for them sometimes if they don't. And can you talk about how you can get out of that sort of like compliance almost way to handle and discipline? Yeah, um, you know, so the literature will say that. Schools that have, you know, principals who believe in punishment and believe that punishment is the best way to engage are the schools that have the zero tolerance policies. Um, schools that are led by people who believe that you can work through adolescent behavior are more inclined to implement alternatives. I live in a state 
where now there's a state law that schools must exercise every other available option before they engage in the use of exclusionary discipline. Which means, you know, through a lot of advocacy <laughs> and a lot of work, um, you know, people were challenging this disproportionate rate of suspension and expulsion because of that reason, both the individual decision making that might lead to some of this and the school based decision making that might say, this is how we're going to handle it in our school because we want our test scores to look like this, we've got to get rid of these kids. We've got, you know, there are all kinds of political reasons why certain kids are pushed out. And that marginalization, I'm arguing, is what we can no longer stand for. And you know, when we start to engage around how we want our schools to look, how we want to educate our children, and how we want to make sure that all kids actually have a right to learn uh, in meaningful ways, then you know, we'll find ways to engage. Um, NC, the National Council on Crime and Delinquency and other organizations, the James Byrne Institute, um, have been working together to develop matrices and other tools, decision-making tools. Structure, you know, so it comes out of the juvenile justice space around structured decision-making tools where you might have a list of options available to you. Um, and what they've been doing is sort of morphing that into a document that could be used for schools so that teachers, administrators don't feel like they have to just kind of go with what they know necessarily, but they could also refer to a set of interventions and be trained on how to use them to engage in a way that is less punitive and also responsive to the particular needs of a child because you know no kid walks in with just one issue if they have a behavioral issue no one person is walking in um, you know they might just be having a bad day or it might be something more routine that needs to be addressed in a different way so people are you know I'm, I'm happy that people are thinking about these issues and really trying to structure them but I think there's got to be a balance between you know what our laws are requiring certain you know agencies to do and what our advocates and scholars are doing to help support that. Uh, Dr. Morris, thank you very much for thank being you, here Dr. today. Morris.